fellow songwriters, Trey Xavier here. Today, I wanna to talk about writing songs that have unusual song structures. In order to demonstrate this today, I'm gonna to break down how I wrote the song Purgatory by my band In Virtue. So I picked this song not only because I'm very proud of it and I love how it turned out, but also because it has a very unusual song structure. It goes a lot of places in four and a half minutes. It does have all of the usual elements like verses, choruses, bridges, etc. but it also has some parts that I don't even really have good names for. And it's a very non-traditional song structure overall. For example, there are two bridges. Why are there two bridges? Well, um, we'll get into that. Real quick before we get started, I have a brand new songwriting course out called Complete Rock and Metal Songwriting. So if you're interested in learning more about how to write songs, Everything that I know about writing songs is in this course. It's 15 hours of learning to write guitar parts, vocals, lyrics, melodies, transitions, drum and bass parts, the works. So if you're interested in that, there's a link in the description where you can find out more. One of the biggest and I think ugliest problems that I see, especially with metal bands in amateur songwriting, is through composing. So like part salad, where the structure of the song is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. Okay, it just keeps going and going, tacking random parts onto the end of whatever the last thing was. And there's no cohesion, there's no repetition. Everything is just completely random and meaningless, really. Do you ever see the Too Many Cooks video? when they just keep like introducing new people over and over again, it's like 30 minutes of like a sitcom intro where they just introduce a hundred characters and there's no show. It's kind of like that. If you haven't seen that, look it up. I promise that you will regret it. <laughs> this does not make for good songs. It does not create a good experience for the listener. And it's 10 times as much work because you have to generate so much more raw material. This song probably has too much stuff in it. I'm a little bit of a maximalist. I like a lot of layers and cool stuff, but everything that's in there does serve a very specific purpose. And I made sure to have this motif appear a lot, on a lot of different instruments, in a lot of different sort of sneaky ways, a lot of different registers, and it plays a lot of different roles in this song. So that gives it a lot of cohesion. Because I knew that it was going to be an extended and a bit of an unusual song structure, I felt pretty good about denying the payoff of the chorus by by a bit. So we go actually go through two complete verses before we actually hit a chorus. A lot of what I did on this song was just managing the dynamics to deliver the biggest possible payoffs. It has some really low dynamic parts for a metal track and I think they contrast really well with the big sort of all out kitchen sink parts of the song. This involves things like adding and removing layers, changing where the backbeat goes on the drums, changing how the guitars are performed. For example, if it's sort of tight staccato things, palm muted or open or big open chords, and then just the overall density of the part. Like, are there a lot of really busy things going on? Is there a lot of tremolo picking guitar parts, a lot of double kick on the drums, that sort of thing. So I started the song with this riff. <laughs> It's just a pentatonic riff, so it doesn't really have any spicy notes in it or anything, but the rhythm is very spicy. It does this really cool turnaround thing that I like a lot. It, it just starts in a different place every time it repeats, so it feels like it's doing something a lot more complicated than it is and it grooves pretty good. And then I came up with the first line of the song, actually. I know I usually say, don't do things in chronological order, but sometimes it just kind of flows right out of you. So the first line was, nothing is worse than this. Because I, I had the idea that it was going to be about purgatory, about this guy stuck in purgatory and eventually deciding that it was time for him to break out of out of purgatory, out of this sort of self-imposed punishment that he'd had. Purgatory is is just the mayonnaise of hell. It's this totally bland in-between. The reason that I'm showing you this first is because this is the primary motif that repeats throughout the song. This cool little riff, I turn into a bunch of different things throughout the course of the song. 
And it's one of the elements that makes it feel cohesive, even with a kind of longer, weirder song form. So in Pro Tools here, I have color coded the different parts of the song so you can see where different things come back. Kind of a lot of stuff to pack into four and a half minutes. But when I listen to it, it makes perfect sense to me. I mean, obviously it does because I wrote it, but still every single time I listen to it, it takes me on the same ride. As songwriters, we're kind of like Roller Coaster Tycoon. You ever play that game where you build a roller coaster and then you get to put little people on it and if you were a sadist, you uh, made it so they went flying off the end and everyone died. But if you build the ride right the first time, people will come back over and over and over again to experience it. So I'm gonna show you how I built that ride for Purgatory. Now, I showed you how it starts out with this riff. As soon as we hit the first verse, it's the same riff identical, except it's now down a fourth. All I did was move it down a string to the low A string on my seven string guitar. And then I cut the drums to half time. Nothing is worse than this. I am a prisoner in purgatory. I left you to die alone. Now I'm rooted here where nothing grows. I it's enough of a variation to really give us a, the feeling that it's something new and fresh, even though it's basically identical. And of course it's got the lyrics on top of it. The motif is still there. It's literally identical, just in a different key. Up next, I decided to take a bit of a left turn pretty much immediately to this little interlude bit. I am stuck in a loop. I don't know how to break. It's a so if you listen to the right channel at this part. So that's, that's the motif again. Now it's just like two octaves higher. It's still half time like the part before it, but the dynamic level has dropped a ton. It's mostly carried by this sort of drum loop thing. Which I like a lot. Uh, I made this from scratch. I didn't like pull this out of a, a library or something. It's very, very sparse. Um, some of the elements we've got are these really high tinkly piano chords. And then halfway through, we kick it up a notch by adding a bunch of stuff. Check it out. That you say are just sounds that you make. You're me. So we added an octave up on the motif guitar. We added the bass. The drums started playing something slightly different. They added this cool funky little hi-hat thing. We added some harmonies to the vocal. And then we get dumped right back into the heavy with the second verse, just right into it. Verse two is basically exactly the same as verse one, but it's got different lyrics now. Part of the reason that I did this was to keep it from getting too dynamically big because the next thing that happens, I wanted to feel bigger. I wanted it to feel like we took a big step up to the pre-chorus before we get to the chorus, which is the biggest thing that's happened so far once we hit it. The pre-chorus here opens up quite a bit. We started the song off with the backbeat on two and four in what's called normal time or regular time, full time. I I'm not really sure actually, but everything since then has been half time. When we get to the pre-chorus, we're cranking it back up to full time, except now the backbeat is on one and three. And then we double time it for a little bit here. So that's one element that I that I play with a lot in this song. So here at the pre-chorus, we've added some more open guitars uh, and some lead guitar parts to sort of fill it out a bit more. The motif at this part is on the rhythm guitars. So it's still da 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 da. Pretty subtle, and it's not exactly the same, but it's there. The sort of mission statement for In Virtue is that I just took all the parts of power metal that I loved 
and I got rid of all of the cheesy stuff that I didn't like. The Dungeons and Dragons, the leather pants, the, the falsetto parts. I like the melodic parts, the fast drum parts. This drum beat that's coming up here, that's my jam. I like the keyboard parts, big orchestrations, just being very ambitious and going all out. Lots of harmonies too, big vocal harmonies, I love those. So I left the sort of double time running through an epic field power metal beat for the chorus. It's something that we haven't heard yet, so we had something to build to. Now I've, even in the chorus, left somewhere to go because we have three choruses total. So if we threw everything at the first chorus, we'd have nowhere to go from there. Once again, halfway through the part, a couple of things changed. This to me is a great way to keep your listeners interest. Just change a couple of things, add something, take something away, change the power hand on the drums. You'll notice for the first half, hi hat, second half, right. The other thing that I did was the first half has no harmonies on it at all. I need to see the sun again. The second half, we add a harmony, but it's a lower harmony, so it's still a bit subtle. I hate the cold. I feel the hardness. Here, I've incorporated the motif in a pretty subtle way. Sort of a little nod, a little ear candy. So after being blasted with a big saturated chorus, I like to have a little bit of a break. This is still intense, but a lot less layers of stuff. It's just this big riff that everybody's playing together. Almost to bring the mood down a bit. So then we've brought it back down to halftime on the drums and the power hand is on the crash because it's pretty open. Everything is, is big open notes. Nothing is staccato, short, um, palm muted or anything. It's pretty snaky and sustained notes. But now we're gonna crank it back up to full time with the guitar solo. Now, I actually am gonna call this section the intro riff again, because it is the same riff that we started with, but it's also the guitar solo. Like, do we call the section the guitar solo or the intro riff? Well, it's both, of course. I think in terms of the song structure, better to think of it as the intro riff, but I felt like just playing it again as is without anything on top of it was very boring. So I figured what a great opportunity to have a guitar solo because then it serves two purposes. It's efficient. Basically identical to the intro riff as well, except that we've got some keyboard parts that sort of fill out these weird chords that I imply. It's a bit subtle, but I felt like it needed it. Now, if you recall, our first two verses were basically identical, except that they had different lyrics. Now we're on to the third verse, and I felt like I really had to kick it up because now we're really moving the plot along. So, a couple different things happen here in the third verse. Number one, we're riding on the crash for the power hand. And then maybe even more important than that, we've layered some keyboard parts on here. And this is playing a variation of the melody from the chorus. And it works really well, I think. The darkness. I need to feel again. You 
So that gives a little bit more harmonic context to the riff, I think. Because it's a pentatonic riff, it doesn't have a whole lot of harmonic information in it, but that also means that it fits really well in a lot of different harmonic contexts. So, as I've filled it out with this melody, suddenly it feels a lot fuller. It feels more like we're moving, like we're going somewhere. And I think that works out really super well to bring us to this next part, which is the interlude again. So you remember our interlude from before. This is now the same part, but everything is kicked up 10 notches. The vocals are all out instead of sort of quiet and breathy. There's synthesizer playing the lead, the motif that used to be on the lead guitar. The drums are double time now with the double kick going all out and the snare on one and three. Rhythm guitars are playing open tremolo picking. And it's the same thing. Now it's grown so much. It's kind of like when you meet a friend's kid, you know, and they're a baby and you're like, oh, little baby. And then you don't see your friend for a really long time. And then you meet the kid again and he's 13 and he's taller than you. And you're like, what the hell? You were this big. They, they grow even when you're not looking at them. And of all the parts in the song, this one has the most growth. It goes from the smallest to the biggest. The change from what it was to what it is, is the most. I personally think that every part of a song should grow. If it comes back, it should have grown somehow, some way changed to be better or, or just dynamically different. I usually like it to grow. So like, for example, the first chorus is kind of small the second chorus is bigger, and then the third chorus is this huge all out thing. Or you can kind of go the other way and have a super down chorus. You'll see what we do in this song. I kind of do both. So if you're writing songs with long or non-traditional song structures, it's okay to have parts that aren't verse, chorus, verse, bridge, whatever, but it should still be there for a reason. It should have significance in the plot of your song, in the story. It needs to be there for a reason. And if you bring it back and it's grown and it's changed and gotten better, the audience is gonna lose their mind. It's like this character in the beginning of the movie that you're like, oh, who's this person? Eh, that doesn't really seem like that important, but there's they do something. And then later on, it turns out to be crazy significant, super important to the plot. And you go like, oh my gosh, the guy from, ah! That's what we did here. Then we've got pre-chorus two. Actually, after all that, this pre-chorus, I think, is identical to the first one. So, after all that, I didn't even do it. You don't have to do it for everything, everything, all right? So now we're on to the second chorus. Right out the gate. The Much more harmony. Then a different ending. Pretty much the only difference in this chorus is that I added a layer of higher harmonies on it and the ending is different to take us into the bridges. So why the hell did I put two bridges in the song? Well, because I'm a masochist, a little bit, but also because I wanted to advance the plot line in a certain way. This song is going to be on our forthcoming album, which is a concept album. In spite of the fact that this song dropped like three years ago. We released it as a single before we knew we were gonna do an album. All right, don't worry about it. <laughs> and so this part is very important for advancing the plot line. He sort of, in the first half, realizes that he's he's been punished enough. The first line is, have I not suffered enough? So he sounds kind of like sad and like, woe is me right there. But then he gets pissed. So the second part of the bridge, which I call the scary bridge, he gets, he gets angry. Not one more day. I am not your slave. I'm setting myself free. This will not be my grave. I couldn't not 
make it angry sounding for those words. I wrote those words and I was like, this has to be so angry and scary. So I wrote this this thing. And part of what makes it scary are the the various elements that are layered on top of it. Let's see, I wrote this rhythm guitar part first, I think. Pretty much all over a D note pedal tone. And then I added these lead guitars that are maybe a little bit kind of typical Meshuga evil drone thing. And then we've got these scary keyboards. A lot of really cool layered synths that make it sound pretty terrifying, I think, as well as these war drums. Right, added the lead guitars. a soundscape that made it scarier to listen to. People consistently tell me that this first bridge is their favorite part of the whole song. I sort of have a talent for writing bridges, more so than anything else. I don't really know why. Maybe because I love them more than any other part of the song, but I don't know. It just kind of worked out. Part of it is that I, sort of the way that I sang it, very different from how I usually sing. Um, you can hear I sort of slid around a bit. I literally couldn't even do a double of the vocal on this part because I don't even know what I did really. I, I couldn't reproduce it. I sort of, it's very loosey goosey, almost raw. I, I don't know what I did, but it sounded good and we left it. But you can hear him, me, the character, becoming sort of progressively more aggressive in the vocal. Until he explodes. And then here we have sort of a musical representation of him leaving purgatory. It sort of climbs up. And that takes us back into the pre-chorus. With new lyrics. And so then that brings us to the final chorus, which I knew I wanted to be very, very low dynamic level. And it actually starts out with just piano and vocal, but we had to, we had to make it feel like he was going somewhere first. So we have this pre-chorus and it's the same as the pre-chorus is previously, except that the lyrics and the melody are different. Once again, just in a way that moves the plot forward. This is something I like to do a lot. And I talk about this in my songwriting course a bit when it comes to transitions. I like the drum fill to really hint at what's coming more than anything else. This is a big slow down drum fill. <laughs> Because if it was a it wouldn't hint at the thing that's coming. Um, everything sort of just like comes down to where it's going to be rather than just a stark cutoff. And I think that transitions very neatly into this last chorus, which starts out with just piano and vocal. And then we're back into the full out chorus, but we gave him something just a little bit different to, to break it up a bit, you know? A, a, like I said, it needs to grow, even if it's gonna shrink first. Shrinking is cool too. Just give it something different, some kind of a variation that makes it feel like there's a reason for that chorus or that part to be there again, instead of just copy and pasting the same thing exactly. It gives it 
meaning. It gives it much more meaning. It makes it feel intentional and not just like you're tacking stuff on to the end of your song, new stuff all the time, or just copy and paste it. Those are the two worst versions of what you can do because you want consistency, you want stuff to come back, you want it to repeat, but you want to do it in a meaningful way. If you're just copy and pasting it exactly, that's not really exciting. And if it's always something new that's unrelated to what's come before, that's also not exciting because it doesn't feel like you're taking your audience on a nice ride and giving them a meaningful plot calling back to other things that have happened. Instead, it feels like you're taking them for a ride. You know what I mean? Like somebody says, oh, you're just taking me for a ride, aren't you? When you're almost lying to them. If you're gonna do that, you can't really expect to have a lot of repeat listeners because they're not gonna feel like you gave them what you promised. They're gonna be disappointed and sort of blue-balled by the song. You built up to, to nothing. In this case, what I've given them is the biggest, most epic, all-out version of the chorus that I possibly could layered a, uh, some more keyboards, a bunch of harmony parts, some call and response vocal parts. And I've changed up the lyrics in such a way that it puts a cap on the whole thing. Now, instead of him being all woe is me and I hate the rain, I hate the cold, I hate the darkness, it's I beat the rain, I beat the darkness, I'll live to see the sun again, I'll face the cold, I'll break the heartless, I'll live to feel your love again, but as of now, my sentence ends in purgatory. And then we get the big riff again, and it is basically the same as before, except there's a big slowdown at the end. And we get these cool kicks that go along with the, um, the vocals. Also, it starts before the measure instead of right on the one. And then a slowdown. So now we've got the outro, which is just piano and vocal, but the piano has the motif as well as those climbing bass notes. And then this is a callback to the, that ending of the bridge that took us into the pre-chorus. I picked this part because I wanted to send the song off with a sense of hope and, and forward momentum, moving on with your life, which is really about what this song is all about. So I left it unresolved as well. In the vocal, anyway. We sort of land on a big piano note, just, just so you know the song is over more than anything else. So by the time we reach the end of the song, hopefully you felt like you just went on this huge epic journey that meant something and wasn't just a bunch of random parts stuck together with no real cohesive thought process mapping it out. It feels like the songwriter knew all along where they were going and wasn't just like also in the back seat of the car with you, you know what I mean? Like in cartoons when they're like, wait a second, yeah. you're the driver. If you're in the back seat, who's driving? Part of the way that I gave it so much cohesion is that rather than just trying to come up with something completely different every time it was time for a new part, instead of looking forward to new things, I looked back to what was already there and I pulled from that. And that makes it feel like every part of it is connected. What this does is generate buy-in from everyone, from yourself, most importantly, from your bandmates, and from your audience. Song structure is just one of the many topics that I cover in my course, Complete Rock and Metal Songwriting. So if you wanna learn everything that I know about writing songs, it's all packed into the 15 hour course that you will find at the link in the description. And if you enjoyed this video, please let me know what you would like to hear more of from me in these tutorials, and I'll see you real soon. I'm